Hey everyone, thanks so much for checking out this content on the Hillview YouTube channel. My name's Martin. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, we're two of the pastors at the church and it's our joy to welcome you to this time. We would love it if you were able to come and join us in person. If you'd like to do that, there's some contact details at the end of the video for how you can get in touch and we'd love to connect you up in that way. Uh, but we also understand that maybe you don't feel that you're able to join us in person yet. And so we do hope that this video is a blessing to you, that you find out a bit of what's happening in the church and you're able to study God's word with us. Um, we also understand that some people have been joining us from further afield. And we would love it if you could be part of a local uh, fellowship, a local church. And, and we would love to help you with that as well. And so if we can, please get in touch with us. But it's great to have you here with us. Yeah, so we're just praying that you will be blessed and helped by this content and that Jesus will be glorified through this video. So take care. God bless. Here are a few things coming up at Hillview for you and our church family. Join us for our monthly prayer gathering tonight at 6.15pm in the Hillview Lounge. Let's come together to pray for the world and our church family. To keep up to date with what is happening at Hillview, please sign up for our weekly news at hillview.cc forward slash mailing list. There will be a feedback session on Wednesday the 13th of December at 7.30pm to discuss the recent church forum updates. More details will be shared soon, but please keep this date free. During the service, we will uplift our offering. If you're new with us, please don't feel under any obligation to give. We're just so glad that you are here. If you did come prepared to give, there are several ways that you can do that. You can place your gift directly in the bowl as it comes down your row. You can give via bank transfer, or you can also give online at hillview.cc forward slash give. December is fast approaching and we are excited to invite you to several services we have planned. Here are the details. The Children's Church will perform their Nativity service on Sunday the 10th of December. On Sunday the 17th of December we will have two Carols by Candlelight services for you to choose from, one at 4pm and the other at 7pm. In addition to our morning worship service, we will have our traditional Christmas Eve service on Sunday the 24th of December at 6.30pm. And on Christmas Day, we will invite you to join us at the Hillview Building at 10.30am for a 45-minute all-age service to celebrate Jesus' birth. And finally, on Sunday the 31st of December, we will have our year-end reflection service, where we will look back on God's goodness and his work in our lives over the past year. We hope to see you there. This is the last in our, our mini-series about buildings. Um, Dan helped us think about buildings as time machines. Um, Scott talked about the use of our homes in fulfilling the church's mission. And last week, Martin shared about some of the, the shouldn'ts and shouldn't, the should-dos and should-nots of how we should think about church buildings. And, and so with all that in mind, we're sitting here this morning in a, in a church building. Um, and I guess somehow or another, we've reached the conclusion that maintaining these buildings, which have been passed down to us from previous generations, is a good thing to do. That is a good use of the resources that, that God has given to us. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to try and provide a bit of a, a biblical framework for thinking about church buildings, and, and these buildings in particular. Um, this building we're sitting in, was established and built, and, and first, uh, first people met in this 40 years ago uh, next year, 20, 1984 it was founded. And an overarching question I've had in my mind as I've been kind of thinking about this stuff over the last week or so is, how do we ensure that these buildings that we have express God's character and his purposes? And, and I guess as I've gone through this, I think this sermon will probably end up raising more questions than it does answer anything. Um, and if, if nothing else, this is about provoking a conversation about how we move forward from here. And I want to do that under four broad headings uh, this morning just to help provide some, a framework, I suppose, to, to hang our thoughts on. I want to think about making a name made known 
John prayed about God's name being made known. What does it mean to make God's name known? I want to then look at some of the things that we need to hold on to as we think about church buildings and our use of church buildings and how they should express something of God's character. And I think there are three things I've kind of come to. One is around a firm foundation. Every building needs a foundation. What are the functions of the church and how does a building help us fulfill those functions? And then I want to think about the future that's anticipated for the church in the very distant future. We don't know when that is going to be, but we know that at one point, history will come to an end and the church will be united as New Jerusalem with God in heaven. So to help us think through this, there's a number of passages I'm going to go to in the Bible. Um, so it'd probably be really useful if you have a Bible in front of you as I kind of track through some of these things. And Jacob's got the words that'll come up behind me as well. So the first thing we'll think about is making a name known. I think all buildings, it's fair to say, make a statement about something or someone. If you think about the, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, it's currently the tallest building in the world. It points skyward straight out of the desert and reaches a height of 828 meters, which is 2,700 feet. That's pretty remarkable. And there's one actually being built or planned to be built in Jeddah, which will be even higher. They're looking to reach a kilometer into the air. The stated aim of building the Burj Khalifa was to put Dubai on the map and to attract investment. It was built with the purpose of making a statement to the world. And it follows in a long line of audacious buildings that have been designed to grab attention over, over the years. I want to track through a little bit of history, and I want to go right back to the first building project that we can read about in the Bible, and you find that in Genesis chapter 11. So this is after the flood. Noah and his family have been rescued in, in the ark from God's judgment. The earth's been wiped out, and now the population on earth is, is increasing, and the people are all together in one place with one language and actually under one king, Nimrod, the mighty hunter. So I'm just going to read Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. It's about the Tower of Babel. And that, apologies for my tar. It's my Northern Ireland accent. Tower. <laughs> Claire, Claire will correct me afterwards. Anyway, you know what I mean. It says this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for, mort for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So here we read about the invention of the brick, and it's almost comical, it's almost like they've invented this brick, and they kind of think, oh, what are we gonna do with a brick? Let's build a city and a tower. And this new technology, what they decide to do is to build a city with a centerpiece of that city, a tower that will reach to the heavens. The building project that they have is motivated not by a desire to see God glorified, but to make a name for themselves. It's in direct defiance of God's command to Noah. After the flood, Noah, when God renewed the covenant with Noah, told Noah to go and fill the earth 
in its entirety. And instead, what we find is that the people haven't spread across the earth. They're all together in one place in direct defiance of God's command. And instead of glorifying God, what they want to do is glorify themselves and make a name for themselves. They want to become godlike. And God comes down from heaven and judges them by confusing their language and scatters them across the face of the earth. The very thing that they didn't want to happen, God comes and does that, and he scatters them across the face of the earth. God disowns and divides mankind into separate nations. But at this point, it's all not lost. God will enact a rescue plan, and he does that by choosing a nation founded through Abraham. And as we trace the arc of history forward from the Tower of Babel and the, and the kind of the, the dispersion of the nations, God then calls Abraham out of, out of where he is in the land of Ur, and he sends him to Canaan, which is the, the, the promised land that God wants to set his own kingdom up for forever in, when we read of what happens through King David and then Solomon and so on. And when the people of Israel, you know, get exiled from the land, it all seems again like it's all over. 400 years, they're in exile in Egypt. And then they come back into the promised land, as we've been thinking about when we were looking at Haggai. And then through King David, God promises to establish a kingdom which will last forever. And at this point in Israel's history, when they have inherited the land, 480 years after they've returned from exile in Egypt, David has it in his mind to build a city, but also to build a house, a permanent dwelling place for God. And we can read about that project in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And God says that it's not David to build that city, it's not, it's not David to build the temple, it's King Solomon, his son, who will build the temple in Jerusalem. And if we read 1 Chronicles 22, verses 1 to 11, it talks about the commission that David gives to Solomon to build this temple. It says, then David said, here shall be the house of the Lord God, and hence, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. David commanded to gather together the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he set stone cutters to prepare dress stones for building the house of God. David also provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for clamps, as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing, and cedar timbers without numbers. For the Sidonians and Tyrians brought great quantities of cedar to David, for David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, of fame and glory throughout all lands." I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. Then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever." Now, my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God, as he has spoken concerning you. This temple building in Jerusalem, in Israel, is also designed to make a statement to the world. But it carries a very different message to the message that was sent by the Tower of Babel. The primary purpose of this temple, and if you read through uh, the, the kind of the building of the temple and so on, repeatedly what you see is this requirement for the, for the primary purpose of the temple to, to declare the name of the Lord, to make the name of the Lord known. 
And this building is to be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all lands. This building is to communicate God's glory and his renown. If we kind of track forward in history, Solomon's temple was then destroyed when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. And as we're studying in Haggai, that temple was eventually rebuilt in 516 BC. And then in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. And in the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, the second temple, Solomon's the second temple was, was, was rebuilt, was completely destroyed. And that was just as Jesus had foretold in Matthew 24. It says this, Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that, not, that will not be thrown down. God's people, the church, don't need a temple building to gain access to God. When Jesus died on the cross, when you read the gospel accounts, the veil which separated the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God, from the outer courts of the temple that separated his people from himself was torn in two. Once and for all, Christ's Christ's death on the cross made atonement for our sins and once and for all took away the barrier that exists between man and God. And as Martin emphasized last week repeatedly, the church is not a building and the building is not a church. Early Christians, when they were scattered from Jerusalem because of the persecution across the Roman world, met in one another's homes. And then in the fourth century, around about the fourth century uh, AD, following the adoption of Christianity, first of all by Armenia as a, as a nation state adopted Christianity, and then under the, the Emperor Constantine, the Roman Empire essentially adopted Christianity. What we find is that the church starts to build buildings to worship in. And that has continued right the whole way down from the fourth century to today. And as I said, this building that we are in this morning was opened 40 years ago. It seems that wherever the church is established around the world, buildings soon follow. Why is that? Church buildings make a statement to the world. You can't hide a building. What they do is they announce the presence of a community of God's people. And the question is this, whose name do they seek to glorify and bring attention to? So I think we do need to be always mindful that the, the church is not a building. But we can use buildings to say something to the world about who God is and what his purposes are. And we need to do that in the context of a way that brings glory and honor to God's name and not to our name. Because we need to be careful that our church buildings don't become towers of Babel or modern day, or the modern day equivalent. So with that in mind, how do we then ensure that our church buildings are a visible expression of God's character and purposes, and do not become a way of drawing attention to ourselves? And I think there are three things I want to to move on to. One is firm foundation, Second, the functions fulfilled, and the third, a future anticipated, just to help us think about these things. First of all, a firm foundation. I think we all know that any building is only as strong as the foundation on which it rests and continues to rest. The ability of that building to serve the purpose for which it was established requires the foundation for that, for the foundation of that building to remain intact. And if a church, and I'm now talking about the people who make up the church, make up the body, don't build on the right foundation, or if we end up mixing the foundation with impurities, those foundations will ultimately crumble and fail. And what happens on the inside that's not visible will soon become visible and apparent. You only have to walk down Union Street in Aberdeen 
to see what happens to churches, church buildings, and the people who once gathered there, who have in some way tampered with the foundations on which those buildings were established. Buildings which once resounded to the singing of God's praises, like we've been doing this morning, are now dancing to a radically different beat and a destructive tune as nightclubs and casinos. Dan was right to speak about church buildings being time machines and for those time machines to uncompromisingly hold on to the gospel to ensure that they exist for a long time into the future. In order for that to happen, it starts with getting the foundations right and keeping the foundations right. The fledgling church in Corinth was in danger of blowing itself apart because of divisions over who they should follow. Paul wrote his first letter to them, recognizing that what was playing out at a surface level in the divisions within the church was actually a deep-rooted problem with the foundations. Just turn to 1 Corinthians 3 verses uh, 10 to 17. I'm just going to read how Paul frames this, this, this issue of getting the foundation right as a church. He says this, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. The key verse here is verse 11. It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The church is established on one and only one foundation, and that is Jesus Christ. There is absolutely no room for anything else in the mix in the foundations. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus Christ alone. Samuel Stone wrote, wrote the hymn, um, The Church is One Foundation. I think he expresses it much better than I could of, of what does it mean that Jesus Christ is the only foundation. In the verse first, this is how he expresses it. He says, The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Jesus Christ, in pursuit of his holy bride, chose to establish a church here in Aberdeen in 1978, a people for whom he died, a people for whom he gave new life. In 1984, this community of Christ's followers built this room we're sitting in this morning. The faces may have changed and always will change, but to this day, the foundation of Hillview Community Church is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is no room in the foundation for mixing any other ideologies or beliefs that are prevalent in the culture around us. There is no room in that foundation for a version of Jesus Christ that is conjured up in our imagination of what we think he ought to be like. We must always test the foundations to make sure that we're building on the Jesus Christ who's revealed in God's word and the whole counsel of God's word. <coughs> so now that we've considered the, for the foundation, I want to go on to think about, okay, what are the functions that a church needs to fulfill and how does a building fit in with that vision of those functions, so functions fulfilled. The New Testament doesn't provide us with a definitive list anywhere that it's nicely kind of packaged up to say, church needs to do X, Y, and Z, and you can tick off all the boxes as you go down. The Bible doesn't work like that. But neither is it silent about what is expected. 
And theologians help, have helpfully extracted some of these essential functions out of God's Word and put them down in lists for us. And one of the ways in which the church has talked about these functions or activities of a church is uh, they're, they're termed the means of grace, the way in which God brings blessing to His church within the fellowship of a church body. And all of these things, all of these means of grace, all of these activities, all of these functions are designed ultimately to display God's glory to the world. And they're described as means of grace because they're actually gifts, undeserved gifts that God gives to His people, the church. Here's one list of these activities compiled by Wayne Grudem, who's a, a theologian. And if you've been around church for any length of time, you'll recognize these, maybe not in a list like I've, I'm going to list them, but you will recognize most of these things, hopefully. So number one, teaching of the words, baptism, the Lord's Supper, prayer for one another, worship, church discipline, giving, the use of spiritual gifts, fellowship, evangelism, and personal ministry to individuals. There's 11 things at least that the church here in this place should be doing on a week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. The Holy Spirit uses all of these functions and works through these in the context of a local church family to bless individuals, but to bless us corporately as we worship together. And I think it should be clear from that list that none of those activities necessarily require or demand us to have a church building to fulfill them. We've had baptisms at Aberdeen Beach. But it is true to say, I think, that several of those activities are only done in the context of people gathering together in one place at one time. Like we're doing here this morning. Like a baptism, like sharing the Lord's Supper with one another, like praying for one another corporately. We do that collectively together in one place at one time. So in that context, having a building where we can go to to fulfill those functions can be a helpful thing. And I'm just going to pick up four of these activities or functions that benefit from having a building to fulfill them. And just to consider them this morning, just as I, again, these are just starters for conversations as you go away and think about this and pray about this. What does this mean for for us as a church together? I'm just going to pick up on four of those. That's not to exhaust the list. So first of all, teaching of the Word. The primary means of grace that God uses to bring people to salvation and also then thereafter to build and equip his church is the Word of God. Jesus himself quoted scripture when he was tempted. He said this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus, we also find find in Luke's gospel that he used to go regularly to the synagogue on the Sabbath to hear God's word read and taught. In Luke 4, 16, it says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. God has ordained for his word to be preached and taught. That's how people come ultimately to know who Christ is and to follow him. In 2 Timothy 2, which which Dan uh, shared from, Paul gives a charge to Timothy. He says in in 2 Timothy uh, 3, Uh, verse 14. I'm just going to read a few verses. It says this, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the, man, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, 
rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Every Sunday morning, we gather together and churches all around the globe gather together to spend part of their time preaching the Word of God. And even this morning, as we're in here, the children are through in classrooms being taught the Word of God. And through the week, we don't necessarily meet in this building, but we meet in homes to be taught and hear from the Word of God in small groups. This is no accident. Baked into the design of these buildings is the provision for God's Word to be taught. We have this room. We have the classrooms. At one time, when IBC, International Baptist Church, was established, there was Sunday school, which was adult Sunday school, which is why the building looks the way it does primarily, because of the, the classes. And then on a Tuesday morning, if you come here, the Ludies Bible Study Fellowship are scattered through this building being taught in classes. The question that we have today is how should we take these rooms and how do we make them much more effective as a means of teaching God's Word? So that's the first thing. Second thing is worship. Down through the centuries, God's people have gathered together with worship through, through singing. And when we gather together in one place and raise our voices in unison, in songs of praise, that's a way in which God can draw near to us as a fellowship. If, we go, if I just go back to Solomon's temple... When the temple was finished, Solomon assembled the nation of Israel together as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the sanctuary. And in, in 2 Chronicles 5 and, and verses 13 to 14, it talks about what happened in the context of bringing the Ark of the Covenant in and people gathering together and raising their voices in praise. This is what it says. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison and praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpeters and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord fill the house of God. When we sing together in this place on a Sunday morning, when we worship together, when we lift our, our voices together, God hears that and God chooses to bless, one, bless us in that. I think the other thing about a church sanctuary, a place like this, a space like this, it should also enable us and lead us into a way of worshiping God. Not only in the way in which we sing together, in the, in the way that we're kind of together in, in, the, in, the, in the rows and so on, but I think even on the things that we have on the walls. So these splendor, majesty, strength and beauty, all of these things are there to remind us of who we're here to worship and what he's like. So that's worship. Thirdly, fellowship. The church, the bride of Christ, is described in numerous ways throughout the New Testament as a body, as a living temple. In other words, the church isn't made up of individuals. Each individual is connected to one another. We're all united in Christ by our salvation that we find in him. And as Christians, we're not supposed to be isolated and disconnected from our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is vitally important to be in fellowship with other Christians on an ongoing basis. And when you read about the early church in Acts, one of the distinctive marks of the early church was that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. God's people gathered together in fellowship. And the writer of Hebrews was careful to point out this warning. He said this, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We should be marked out by our fellowship. 
That again doesn't need a building, but it does help. The kitchens that we have here can provide food for us to, to eat together. That was one way in which Jesus repeatedly engaged with, with his disciples was to just meet around the table and, and eat together. So the question is, how can we take these buildings and how can we increasingly use them to bring us together to stir one another up to love and good works? But always remembering that the foundation on which we're building is the Lord Jesus Christ. Last thing on this evangelism. Jesus' last instruction to the disciples was for the church to go and make disciples, to spread the good news of the gospel all over the world. God uses evangelism not only to bring new, new disciples into the church, but God also uses evangelism to bless the ones who are evangelizing. It's a means of grace in the believer's life and in the life of the church. And again, we don't necessarily need a building to fulfill Christ's commission in evangelizing the world. But given that God has provided us with these buildings, we have to ask ourselves, how should we be using them to spread the gospel more effectively? And this goes way beyond just providing short-term lets to the community. I want to ask a question I want to think about this morning is how are we doing as a church, even in those four areas that I've touched upon? One of the things that I've observed over the years is what I would recall a retreat from the new phase of the building to the old phase of the building. Increasingly, our church activities and functions seem to be increasingly focused in this part of the building and less in the new part of the building. The question is, have we got the balance right? Is there more that we could and should be doing with the space, all of the space that we have in this place? There are breakfast clubs and after-school clubs that meet in the gym across there. Those are provided by the community, not by this church. What if we as a church were the ones that could actually provide a breakfast club or a children's club after school and do that in Christ's name instead? What difference would that make? That's just one example. With all of the functions that define what it means to be a church established on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to take the buildings that God has given to us and to use them for his glory. I think the question is, you know, if we can't do that, then we should give the buildings up. Back in 2010, this church, International Baptist Church, as was known then, went through a really difficult season. And that difficult, God was gracious in that because ultimately Hillview Community Church was established out of that difficulty. But I remember one night after an elders meeting, myself and Colin Ross sat in the car park out there and we actually did consider, is it time just to get rid of these buildings? Are they becoming a noose around our necks, so to speak, and preventing us as a church moving forward? I think if we're unable as a church to make the best use of these buildings for God's glory, then we do need to ask ourselves, what's the point in holding on to them? Or at least if they're not serving the purposes for which, the, the, for which we believe are called to fulfill the vision, then we should start to reshape them for the future and for what we need to provide here to continue God's work in this place. Buildings are fundamentally shaped by the function that they need to fulfill. If you think about your homes, you have rooms to eat in, you have rooms to cook in, you have rooms to sleep in. It's the same with this building. We need to have rooms that enable us to fulfill the functions, all the functions that we're called to provide as a church. (coughs) So the final thing I want to move on to is to think about buildings in terms of their form. What should they look like? And this is where 
Um, I'm going to look at the future, future anticipated. I think if, you, if we accept the premise that church buildings need to be a visible expression of God's character and purposes, then how should they look as a result? Does architecture or the aesthetic of a place, of a building like this matter from God's perspective? I think this is a question that the church has grappled with down through the centuries. If you visit the cathedrals, not only in this nation, but if you go to the cathedrals in Europe, what you see is that that the church at times have taken architecture really seriously. If you ever get the chance to go and visit King's Chapel, for example, King's College Chapel in Cambridge, you can't help when you walk into that building to look upwards to the ceiling. The graceful lines of the pillars draw your attention to the upwards heavenwards to the vaulted ceiling. And if the sun is shining through any one of the sides of that building, then what you'll find yourself is engulfed in a kaleidoscope of primary colors as the sun light is scattered through the stained glass windows. These buildings were designed to communicate something of God's majesty and splendor and beauty. In a sense, they do make you more aware of the transcendent. Much like when Solomon built his temple and overlaid everything with gold inside, that gold would have, would have reflected and magnified the light coming off the menorah, which symbolized God's presence. At other times in church history, I think the church has gone the other way, particularly after the Reformation. I think there's been a reaction to the cost and the opulence of, the, of buildings like that. You know, is that the best use of our money when we've got poverty to, to think about and so on? And I think that's a view that's probably prevailed right the whole way through since the Reformation to, to modern day, in, in some, some to, to lesser degrees than others, perhaps. As just one example, in in 1824, um, after the Napoleonic Wars, the Parliament in Westminster decided that a way to celebrate the victory in the Napoleonic Wars was to build churches. That's the country that we used to have. And in 1824, Thomas Telford, the architect, was commissioned by Parliament to build 32 churches across the highlands of Scotland to celebrate the victory. And... Each of these buildings was to cost no more than 1,500 pounds in money of the day. And they were all built in a very similar, either a rectangular or a T-shaped layout with a belfry. The standardized windows for each of those buildings were provided by a company in Aberdeen. And if you visit those buildings, you find those buildings were probably, you'd probably say they're more functional than beautiful. This aesthetic seems to be seems to be the the aesthetic that's persisted through the 20th and now the 21st century. I don't have a fully developed answer to the question of what an appropriate aesthetic should be for these buildings. But I do think we do need to think about the beauty and the majesty of God and how buildings should reflect some of that glory. If I turn to Revelation 21 verses 9, to 27. This is the arc of history played out in the fullness of time. This is ultimately a picture of what the church will become. It says this, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates and the north three gates, on the south three gates and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, 
And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. In this passage in Revelation, the church, that's you and me, and the church down through the centuries is described as a city. This bride for the Lamb, this new Jerusalem, is a place where God and man will dwell together. And this bride, this city, is radiant because it has God's glory. It's a city that's built in the shape of a perfect cube. It's adorned with jewels and nothing unclean can be found in it or will ever enter it. If you look around at what God has created on this earth, the landscapes, all of the creatures, men, women, children, or if you look at the night sky, it can't escape your attention how beautiful God makes things. The stunning majesty we're surrounded with reflects God's glory and his character. How far short of that beauty does anything that mankind create? even at his most beautiful. And we seem to be particularly bad when it comes to buildings, of creating some of the most hideous things to look at. This is what G.K. Chesterton had to say about architecture. Architecture is the most practical and dangerous of the arts. All the other arts we have to live with. There are things we have to live with and some have even said, with regard, of some, with regard to some kind of music and paintings, they are things that we could live without. But architecture is not a thing that we only have to live with. It is a thing we have to live in. We live with it as Jonah lived with a wheel. Jonah couldn't see the monster, and there's a great deal to be said for living in the most hideous house because you can't see, you can see in the landscape, because that's the one place that you will be unable to see it. I think Chesterton has a point when it comes to how we should think about church buildings in the context of God's character and the ultimate destination of the church. There is a place, a right place, for beauty and aesthetics when it comes to church buildings and grounds. You know, just look at the courtyard. But it always needs to be done in the context that Jesus Christ is the foundation. And it's his name that we want to draw attention to and not our own. So to conclude, how do we ensure that our buildings here are a visible expression of God's character and his purposes? It starts with the foundation. 
The ch this church is built on Jesus Christ and him alone. This church is built upon a sacrifice on the cross and his righteousness. And we must never mix anything else with those foundations. This building is here to help us as God's people to fulfill the functions of the church. It's to be used as a means of grace, which God has ordained for our good and for his glory. Teaching the word, worshiping together, meeting together in fellowship, evangelizing, all the prayer together, all of those things, God has provided these buildings for us to enable us to do that in a better way. And we're to do all of this remembering the anticipated future of the church, the bride of Christ, radiant with God's glory. And our buildings should be a reflection of that glory and beauty because all of that is to make his name known here in this place at this time. There's a verse that often comes up, if you notice, at the beginning of our service. It's a verse from, found in Psalm 115, verse 1. This is what it says. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Amen. Amen.